going to, you know, start with a little bit of background and just kind of, you know, do our thing together. And you and I will have a good chat about, you know, TBI, your, your start. You know, I, I'd like to start, if you will, kind of back in 2012 when you kind of kicked it all off as a 25-year-old, you know, and this whole kind of journey thought process started for you just for a little background, if you don't mind, if we can kind of, if, if it sure. makes sense to start there. Because if I'm correct, if I remember doing my research correctly, that was kind of when you were, if I remember, you know, looking yourself in the mirror and staring back at a 25 year old that wasn't quite the person you recognized in the mirror and you decided you wanted to make a shift kind of thing. Does that sound right? Yeah, it's pretty much. Um, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I've always been, you know, and it's a pro and a con, but I've always been an all or nothing person. And, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Um, you know, you have to be the fastest, you have to be the strongest, you have to be the best, but that also means you had to be the most drunk, you had to be out partying the longest, and you had to be this and that, and looking at my family history, um, that's not, not, not a good, good one, and, and uh, I think I was, yeah, back in, yeah, it was 2010 or something like that when I looked my or no, was, yeah, I looked myself in the mirror and I said, look, hey, look, you don't look like an athlete. You don't sound like an athlete. Um, and I've always known deep down in my bones that that's what I am. And that's what I'm, yeah. um, that's what, that's when I'm at my most comfortable. And that's also when I'm at my happiest. So, yeah, yeah, and then then then, then I kind of made a decision. I was like, okay, well, uh, people had been telling me that that um, that <laughs> people had been telling me that yeah, well, you're an addict, and 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 you can you know it, it's clear. I mean, addictive personality. Uh, we can see it. You either go all in or nothing. And for me, it was actually a real surprise because I've kind of lived my life with the blinders on. You know those uh, race horses that have the the blinders on yeah, the side. Yeah. And they got. I mean, I wasn't and it's not a bad thing it's a positive thing i wasn't really interested in what other people thought or whatever other people did and i always kind of um assumed that everyone was the way i was but um yeah it wasn't and then i decided to look i can either be addicted to drugs i can go that way when alcohol probably won't be enough um or then i can turn turn it around and you know pick up sports again and I happened to yeah. be, it's so funny because I happened to be dead drunk at a bar when I, uh, bet, I made a bet with a friend to do a Olympic distant triathlon and that from there, it was all go. <laughs> so that's so, so yeah. funny. I, I, and I read that story, I read that story and that's, I mean, you know, it's, it's ironical and funny at the same time, right? Because yeah. that's, that, that's how life happens sometimes, right? You know, that the, a, a door of perception opens up, if you will. Yeah. And, and bam, there you are. And. You know, I, you know, I have a, I have a performance yoga teaching background as well, Robson. So I oh, used to yeah. teach up in New York city. So I would get a lot of people who were, I'll say shifting of a, a, a worse addiction to a better addiction. There was still was the addiction, right? So they would go from doing drugs and alcohol and, uh, you know, body scarring or whatever they were into. Right. And then they would come into a yoga room and they would take yoga classes five times a day because they were thinking at least that's not as harmful. Right. But it was still overconsumption and overdoing all the yeah. time. Right. So so I find that really interesting. So when you know, as someone with a TBI, as someone with a traumatic brain injury. Right. And, and someone who comes from that addictive background, have things shifted for you at all? Does that addictive quality get muted at all? Is that still front and center or are you have you just learned to harness it in a better way over the years? That's a really good question because they say that with traumatic brain injury, you get better at the things you were good at and you get worse mm -hmm. at the things you were bad at. So I've become a lot more impatient. <laughs> <laughs> I've become a lot more black and white in, 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 in bad senses. Yes. But I've also become, um, a lot more aware of what I don't want in life and what I do want. Okay. And, and, yeah. um, I, sp I've spoken and I, I'm, I'm, I'm so damn lucky because I, I get to speak for, uh, the kids and youth foundation in Finland. So I, sp I've spoken in f 60 schools 
And wow. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Yeah, I have to pinch myself. I think about 10,000 kids have heard me speak, which is just it's, it, I mean, yeah, it's it's the best I'm not even going to call it a job, but anyway, it's the best thing that's ever sure. happened to me. If something good has to come out of all the pain I feel every day, then 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 I'm happy to, that that's it. But they always ask me this it's pretty much the same question. How do you know what you want? And I always say, well, it doesn't matter what you want. You just want to know what you don't want. And then you can find or the thing finds you that you're happy with. Like me, for example. Right. I mean, in 2012, I had been searching already for a few years about what it is. I had went back to old sports. I do, used to do a lot of yacht racing, um, which I still yep. think is awesome. I played hockey. But that didn't quite do it for me. And my friends were doing marathons and they looked at me and said, <laughs> you know, you're not a real athlete if you haven't run a marathon, <laughs> which, right. I mean, yeah. And, <laughs> and I, had, yeah, exactly. Um, but then I found triathlon and it was this it, whole, it, it, triathlon is perfect for me because A, uh, you get to do three sports. B, it's the distances are so hmm, what word should we i think we should use the word inhumane <laughs> because <laughs> i mean for for right. 3.8 kilometers right? yeah. yeah yeah and i mean yeah, right? of course you can you, you can do a one you can do one ironman distance you can do that with the whim i, I with a whim and just like just you know if you decide you're going to finish it you're going to finish it that's not an issue but to do yeah. it well, <laughs> you have to be so dialed in with not only the training part, but with everything else in your life. And I was pretty crap at that, managing my time. But now okay. with, um, with my brain injury, I've become better at it. So a long answer to your, to your question. Um, but it also, the addiction has come out in the form where I was addicted to my benzodiazepine pills, which isn't okay. isn't a surprise because it's one of the most addictive substances in the world, but it's legal. Yeah. And and um, it went so far that I actually physically threatened my psychiatrist and my doctor to you know give me more. Um, and I didn't notice it then, you know. Sure, of course, you were in the middle of it. But yeah. But when I finally met the doctor that actually is one of the key guys that's behind why I'm in such good shape, he looked at me and he said, this isn't smart. And then my mom talked to me afterwards and yeah, it was pretty interesting. That withdrawal, by the way, was yeah. it, that sucked balls. Um, I could imagine. But I could imagine. But yeah, so so, so is, is your mom is your mom a, is your mom a strong influence in this aspect of your life? Is she has she always kind of been by your side and always been a full support for you? I'm super lucky because my family yeah. did not call me crazy or anything like that that I know a lot of other families do when when the doctors don't believe you. Sure. And, uh, the influence my mom's influence is definitely she's one of the main reasons why I'm still on this planet, um, why I'm still yeah. alive. Uh, but not to not to subtract any of the 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 glory and the and 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 the respect that the rest of my family does. But she showed me in two thousand and hang on, it was two thousand and five when I got diagnosed with migraines. Um, and for six months, we spent um, we spent hours in the car just driving around to different doctors and finding the reason for why I had those migraines that I had. And then finally we got to a doctor that actually um, uh, could help me. Um, and it was a mixture of tension headaches and it was a mixture of migraines that had to come out uh, because, well, I got, we know that it's hereditary and it's my mom actually that has the migraines, but she has one that, that doesn't have an aura that triggers it, but I have sunlight yep. and so on. Um, and then she kind of like, she, oh, well, yeah, there we go. That's, not, yep. that's nice. Um, so yeah, right. So, yeah. So um, I wish we didn't have that in common. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. But she she kind of laid yeah she laid the foundation there for me that 
that, and that was for my brain injury. Then it was like, you don't give up, you know, it is, it, it is what it is. It's painful. It's, 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 it's a warped reality, but you just, you, yeah, you don't give up. And so, so yeah, yeah, she was. And then throughout my, you know, reactive depression and all of that, she, she was the one that I could, um, she was the one that listened to me in a special way. Um, she kind of never spoke first. She always spoke when I was, uh, when I had, uh, uh, when I had kind of opened the conversation. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's important. Yeah. Right. There's a right time for all those types of conversations. Yeah. Which is, I mean, I think it's so interesting because we sit, we, I've sat in front of a lot of doctors, MDs and, and physical therapists and, and, and osteopaths and, and all that. And they always tell me what I feel. But I've noticed that the best actually just listen. And my mom was really good at that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. So, so does, your, does your methodical nature, I'll call it maybe potentially your analytical need, you know, does that, does that come from your family as well? Cause I like, look, my, you know, I come from a family who's interested in math and things like that. Right. So there's an, there's an analytical side, but I, I've, as a person also worked over the years to come to enjoy the artistic side, if you will, the blend of art and science. Right. So there's the analytical side, but there's the joyful side of just sitting back and, and understanding the beauty of what science creates in a lot of ways. So I'm, I'm curious as to how, how you process, right? Because I've read a lot about you, of course, and I know, and I know you, you already. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm just really curious as to what is, is triathlon satiating to somebody like you because it quells the analytical, but it allows you to disappear at the same time. Cause that's kind of what I look for in my, when I was a cyclist, I would, I would sometimes go on a six hour ride and I would remember every second, but I don't remember any of it at all at the same time. Cause yeah. I, and I was studying my data, but I was in this moment, I was in this, zone of flow where everything just felt perfect because i was out quiet doing my thing feeling the pain in my legs which i love to feel and life was just good while i was out there right i mean so I don't, I'm, I'm curious how you look at this stuff in that regard you're actually you're probably the 15th or 20th person that calls me analytical and yeah. i don't feel analytical okay um but then again, this is me apparently with my um, blinders on because <laughs> because uh, my girlfriend once asked me, it was in the middle of the night, we woke up and she was like, what are you thinking about? She could, she said she could hear me thinking. And I went, right. And I went, yeah, you know that, that ride I did yesterday, there's something, there's something with my hmm. saddle, I think. And I just <laughs> wonder how... And then she went, okay, yeah, whatever. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and that's when she, we woke up the next day and she went, do you now notice that you, you, that you kind of think about it all the time? And I said, well, yeah, but don't you? And apparently right. people don't. Um, people don't. And then, uh, so the guy that does my bike fit, he asked me, um, we built my bike in, uh, in May. And then in June, he asks me, so have you had any knee pain? And uh, I went, hmm, it's a good question. And then he looked at me and he went, what are you doing? And I went, well, I'm thinking about all the training sessions that I've done so I can give you an answer. And he went, yeah, because why give me an answer on a whim? Because that's, that's how you do it. And I went, right. Wait, so what people just give you an answer without thinking? And he went, yes. But I don't think that's appropriate because if I would give him an answer without thinking, we might change something. You, you, you know what I mean? It's like, of course, it, of course. And then I do send WhatsApp messages to my coaches after every session analyzing it. Um, and I can't, <laughs> I can't turn it off. But the beauty in that is is where, like you said, you're out, you feel everything, but you feel nothing, but everything adds up or then it doesn't. And it's based on what I call the Holy Trinity. Um, and this was, this was before my power meter, 
for me, the holy trinity uh, of, of triathlon was um, heart rate, speed, and then your subjectional feeling. And okay. that's the whole thing that all the time goes, okay, wait. And then, and then, well, then we have to factor in, of course, technique, um, which is how are you running? How are you feeling? And then I, I use this technique that we came up with a friend of, of traffic lights, right? So green is where your heart rate is a bit below, but your speed's a bit higher than it should be. Uh, and you feel easy. Yep. Yellow is performing at base level. And then red is where, you know, your heart rate's really high and your speed's really low and you feel like crap. Um, and then, and then when that hits, I usually visualize, um, me running over the finish line and then everything kind of comes, but so yeah, that's long. I mean, analytical, I guess, but, but the beauty is in that where during training you, you, you kind of do what's told you execute, try to execute exactly what's told. And then afterwards you take a look at the data and then you can build a plan from that. And then for me, it's really important not to talk to my coaches during the session so that I, I can talk, I talk to them afterwards. And then we analyze and we go, okay, well, with this information we have now, that was a good thing. You can do something better there. You, you know what I mean? And then, of course I do. Uh, so, so basically your, your, your coaches are not a crotch, a, a crutch, a crutch. Like when, when, I mean, instead you make decisions based on your knowledge. And then you can execute on race day with the artistic freedom because that's it, right? A lot of triathlon is monotonous execution without you being an artist. But then the race yep. is actually you being the artist. That's when you have your entire color palette and you got that white canvas and then suddenly, yeah. Um, but I do like, I mean... I don't care about my watts or my heart rate or, or anaerobic threshold or, 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 or anaerobic aerobic threshold or that, but I do love the numbers. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you're a closet, we'll call you a closet analyst, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I like what, I like, I've never I thought like about what, that. I like what you said about, I like, I like what you said about your coaches. Cause I, I had the same experience. Um, I never wanted my coaches to be a cheerleader or to be in my ear while I was racing because it was my job to fail or succeed and then to share with them afterwards. If I had them in my ear trying to raise me up or lower me down, and that's it, this is just a, a me thing. Uh, it's not necessarily all athletes, but I wanted to succeed or fail on my own, and they were there to support me before yeah. or after, not during. During was my time. Yes, and I find that interesting that you say that similar concept because not all athletes are built that way. Some of them, depending on your personality profile, right? We're all different. Some people need the cheerleading. Some people need the constant feedback, and you know, absolutely. That, that's why I kind of, yeah, that's why I kind of think of you as a fellow analyst in a way because when that's when, when I, we get along. I to be left because alone. The last yeah. time we spoke, it, it flowed, you know, and and there's and that's what I like about about your mentality too is that. Although you're confined to your aerobic threshold, anaerobic threshold, wattage, uh, speed, distance, it's not that. It's actually about you painting your canvas about being an artist. And that's your form of art. And that took me a very, very long time to understand. Yeah. No, it's such a cool concept. And I, because I think every, every athletic endeavor, and like you said, with a triathlon, you have hours to oh, be yeah. with yourself. Right. And it, but at the end of the day, it's this beautiful chessboard because you have to make tactical decisions every moment of the race. Yes. You are literally making hundreds of thousands of decisions throughout those hours. And you might not even realize it because it becomes intuitive. And I'm going to segue here. You're going to let me segue, uh, Rob. Absolutely. Got to segue into breathing. Right. So it's like, for me, that's the moment where I found when I was a young man after my injuries, after I broke my back, breathing was my way to not become irrational working against my athletic plan, right? So but after, after I got hurt and I was angry and depressed and mad at the world and uh, yeah. I felt like everything was ripped away from me, all those kind of wonderful things you go through during those stages in the beginning, you know, <laughs> you, you, I'm sure you're aware of those, right? So yeah. um, 
I the only thing that could get me back to center was my breathing, and I I didn't become instantly conscious of it. It took me time, and it took me research and understanding, but. I became a very irrational human being back then, and I could not stick to a plan because I was either angry or panicky or up and down oscillating across the spectrum of emotions. I wasn't really able to stay emotionless and, and a workhorse. You know, I was, I was purely addicted to the spikes. Well, kind you're, of thing. I was you're, all you're all, you're all about reacting. So for like Newton's yeah. law says for every action, there's a reaction, but and that's really interesting because I think that, um, especially in today's world with social media and all this kind of crap that's good in, in, in its purity, but it's really crap because people have gone from only reacting to actually thinking about the action. So people have lost their own actions. And it's, it's funny yeah. that you say the, the breathing thing because... Um, I was last weekend, I was uh, in, in, the, in, in Finland doing Ironman Finland. Um, awesome race, which I'm really proud of because I'm a Finn. Um, and uh, I went running with a friend. Um, and, uh, and then without my headphones, because I always have my headphones on when I run. And I was in the middle of the forest because it's a ski resort and there's like nothing, like nothing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And he went, I'm just going to go film those guys over there. He peeled off and I did a 500 meter loop or whatever. And I could hear my breathing. And it was so calming. And it was like, okay, yeah. good, good, good. And, and then when I ran, I could hear that because I only, I, I don't run dr um, or during uh, Ironman races, you're not allowed to have any technical devices on that, that, that play music or film. Uh, obviously, the heart rate monitor and all that. But, and then I was like, okay, hang on. Um, I listened to my breathing and intuitively I went, yeah, I'm pretty on track with my fitness. Um, that's actually pretty interesting. I went, this is a familiar pre-traumatic brain injury breathing pattern. And then that kind of right. centered me. Um, well, you but, actually had that, you actually had that awareness around that. You actually felt that differential. That's pretty well, cool. It, it was so familiar. It yeah. was so, so familiar. It was so, so familiar. I was going slow, but it was so familiar. And, and then it's a contrast because I usually run in the city. We live smack in the middle of Helsinki. And I mean, just the, the amount of noise is just insane. You, yeah. Yeah. You can't have, you can't have that kind of run, you know? And even if I run into the Central Park, there are a lot of people and um, people are really cool, but not when I'm working, which <laughs> right. train, training doesn't. <laughs> yeah, training doesn't feel like working, but it's like sometimes when when someone honks the horn at me when I'm when I'm biking on the road, my first thought is I don't come honking into your office, do I? You know, it's right, like, right. Get right. out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> <laughs> But, but, um, and sometimes I don't even hear the music, although it's on full blast and that's how centered you get. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, that's, that's, uh, breathing is, and we spoke about it last time too. Yeah. It's a good way of letting go of trauma. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of people could benefit from it because it doesn't matter on my scale. If you have the same trauma as I have, we're not comparing here. That's, that's a very important issue. My worst day is very different to your worst day, but it's still my worst day. Right. You know, it doesn't matter. Same if, here, right? Exactly. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter yeah. if it's, if my worst day consists of me dropping the milk on the floor and, and having to clean it up for an hour. And then after that, going to a supermarket and there's not the same milk or the same soap that I used to buy. If that's my worst day, then it's as traumatic as the stuff you and I have gone through. That on paper absolutely could be and, a bit and, worse. and everybody has their own scale where they think their scale is full i i always exactly i have i have young kids i have young kids like i have a 10 year old and a, and a 15 year old and i always talk in terms of you know how, how how full is my cup of frustration and is your cup the same size as my cup right so if i if exactly. i have an eight ounce cup and and for today i'm i'm 90 percent full of frustration well don't be the person that fills the last 10 percent up or you might not be in a good place uh, but the question is how big is your cup and everybody is an individual but we all bear this pressure 
that we put on ourselves. And we all, as human beings, I feel, believe that our pressures are demanding mm. uh, to us and, 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 and high scale. And today's pressures are even more exacerbated because of everything that's going on in COVID and all these other things. So people are yeah. more heightened and more aware. Um, you know, interesting, Robson, I was just speaking with another. Oh, shit. Sorry. Excuse me. No worries. Uh, I didn't mean to do that. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, I was speaking with another ambassador of ours. Sorry about that. I was speaking with another ambassador of ours, a guy named Nick Butter, um, really great guy who runs prolifically runs like almost every day of his life, sometimes runs two marathons a day. Um, guy, guy's amazing. And, and we were talking two about the, marathons a day. Yeah, go go check him out. I'm just, Sianna, Sianna will hook you up with his information before you go. Um, he's this incredible guy that we work with. And he's, I think his next thing he's going to be doing is running around the entire country of Iceland. Um, and, and he has a nonprofit attached. He's out there doing it for awareness purposes, but the guy yeah, literally yeah. runs, uh, I think he literally burns through one pair of sneakers every week. Literally, that was his statement uh, because he's running sometimes five to seven hours a day. Um, Holy it's, crap. It's, 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 he's, but he's a brilliant guy, a lot of fun. But we were talking about this um, symbiotic relationship to breathing. So it's really interesting to me that you bring up the running in the forest because in my world, when I'm coaching people, not just to gain performance, but to come become in tune with their breathing and this kind of symbiotic relationship, your nervous system and your mind has with the breath, because as a human being, we actually respond to the sound of our breath. Our, our ears hear the audible tone of our breath and that sends a signal. And so if your breath is loud and exacerbated, your mind hears that and starts to react. And it's more of a two-way street than a one-way street. So a lot of people think of breathing as, oh, I'm just breathing to catch up with whatever's going on. And in reality, it's a, it's a, it's a looping system where they're both working with each other to kind of figure out the state that you're in. So, so I'm gonna, when you're I'm able to cut, get out of it, so I, I, yeah, go for it, go for it. I'm going to cut a few corners here probably with, with your background and what you know. But for me, it was a huge shock when I saw athletes taking ice baths for minutes on end, I went into an ice bath and I could be there for 30 seconds and then it hurt so much that I had to get out and it hurt for days, you know, pre, pre brain injury. And then somewhere I listened to, to Wim Hof, um, or it was, hang on. No. Yeah. It was my friend who had listened to Wim Hof who told me that, dude, um, you need to separate your parasympathetic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system. And you need to breathe through your nose. And then when you breathe through right. your nose and calm down your breath, then your, your essential governor will tell you that it's all fine. No problem. You can be in ice water for however long you want. And I went, yeah, right. You know? Yeah, right. <laughs> it's like, yeah. What are you a doctor or like, you know, and then, and then he said, yeah, no, 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 I'm not. But, 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 um, I challenge you. And then, you know, when someone says that I challenge you, then, then we all know what happens in my brain. I go, sure. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I went from 15 seconds to being able to be two minutes in water below freezing, mm. which has helped me tremendously with my brain injury because that's yeah. the only time I don't feel a pain that I can't control. Otherwise I'm constantly in pain. Yeah, I understand. And the thing is that that pain feels good. But if I listen to my central governor, I'll be out of there within 15 seconds. But when you can calm that breathing down, and like you said, it's an audible cue to get the hell out of there. But, and that's the same thing, which, so I'm Finnish and we Finns are really good at one thing. And that's being an engineer, looking at the data and then applying it into what we think is reality with t a total disregard for emotional feel, emotional, uh, you know, the emotional, the feelings, and then the body mechanics. Exactly. Exactly. Where people, yeah, exactly. Where people go, oh no, but you should, according to the data, this is your fastest position. And you're like, well, I mean, my neck hurts like hell and I have to get up out of this position every five minutes. So is that then fast? Yes, but you should be able, and then shoulda, coulda, woulda. And that's yeah. where I like how the arrow fit, because people ask me about how does it, 
affect you? And I say, you know, I, I mean, I could send you a bunch of data. I haven't read it, but, but I just know that this helps me. And that's where I think a lot of people, especially in triathlon and these endurance events, uh, or we talk, it doesn't matter if we're talking triathlon, um, sprint distance, full distance, if we're talking ultra marathons, if we're talking the race across America with the cyclists and so on, it doesn't matter. If you can't listen to this, or actually this, because I think this, anyway, you know, how are you gonna actually be able to govern yourself? And how can yeah. you have that dialogue with yourself? And through breathing, you actually can, there's a lot of talk about grounding and that, you know, there's this uh, Zach Efron show. Uh, sure. Yeah, 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 I've planet. seen it. Yeah. And then that guy, the guru, always when they're in a different time zone, he takes off his shoes and he goes onto the grass and says he's grounding himself. Right. Where I go, okay. But then I remember how I, I used to breathe wrong when I'm in cold water. So fine, you know. But how can you be grounded and self-centered if you don't know how to breathe? No, it's virtually impossible. And then how can you be in tune with your own body? Because if um, there's a there, there was a really good article in a Finnish newspaper where a friend of mine said that um, elite and professional sports where we push our bodies has nothing to do with health, but an injured body cannot perform records. I agree with the second part. <laughs> so, so in a sense, in a sense, we're pushing our bodies, uh, uh, as, as well, not me, but as, as like, if you think about these, uh, Usain Bolts and these guys that runs mar run marathons or the cyclists or whatever, it's not intuitive that you do that amount of training. It's probably not. No, not at all. You know, I think, I think I spoke, who would I, I spoke to someone last week who said that, uh, basically our body shouldn't be able to do an Ironman, but with the gradual training we build up the resistance to be able to do it. And we talk to our central governor enough that it lets us do it. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I think of that as it's neuroplasticity, right? It's yes. the ability to rewire the hard wiring, right? At the end of the day. And I think that's a really important concept for, especially for endurance athletes, but for human beings in general, right? The, the conceptual aspect of being able to work with the primal brain, right? The, the amygdala, the pons, the medulla, the, you know, the, the, the hippocampus, like those areas of the brain that are genetically predisposed to protect you, keep you alive, keep the lights on, if you will, yeah. right? It's a lot of people, a lot of people believe that those are set and forget you can't change them, but it's been shown no. that through consistency and over time, there is a neuroplastic element to the ability for the cerebral, you know, capacity to shift and to rewire and grow new connections and all those things. So, you know, in, in a conversation with someone who's experienced TBI, this is not only an important thing to know is valid, but it's an important conceptual thing to live with every day because you have to believe that there's always new growth capabilities. There's always the ability to go beyond what we believe we were designed to be. And it, and that, takes, it takes commitment and consistency, right? And that was the thing that, so every time someone tells you that, show them my Instagram profile. Uh, because 20 neurologists all had a consensus. And that was mm. the fact that the brain is plastic. I can't do anything to reopen the bleeding, uh, the, the points of, of, of hemorrhage in my brain that have shook due to the, yeah. But yeah. there, there was an, I quote, there is no financial or medical reason why we should put down resources on you because you can't uh, you can't uh, you can't rehab yourself into anything else than a person who can't do any sports or work or whatever yeah and that doesn't make sense you know i mean if the brain's plastic why can't i you know so so and I mean, I'm missing 20% of my corpus callosum and I got a pretty big brain bleed here in my frontal, right frontal lobe, which would explain why I couldn't crawl or write. Yeah. But, but, and, and when that should be impossible, according to someone, which it isn't because I did it, 
how can you how can you write someone off like that? Yeah, of and course. Th and then it becomes a question of okay, well, well, hang on. So you're actually talking about what you're willing to do, not what I'm willing to do. Right. And then it becomes a question of well, are you happy with yourself? Have you, you know, if you're if you're uh, if you're uh, mirroring that kind of stuff on me, maybe you should learn to breathe. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. hundred <laughs> percent. And listen, I, I talk, I have the, I have the luxury and, and the, the benefit of being able to speak to medical doctors all the time because of my coaching. So I'll, in order to coach a really great athlete, I might have to convince a, a physio and a, and a director of medical, you know, performance that this breathing thing works. And I'll run into what I call doc. I love doctors with all due respect that there's great doctors out in the world. Right. And so I don't want to make a general statement, but I run into what I call a lot of linear mechanics, right? These, M these MDs that read a book. And so what's in the book must be true. And there, I can't, I can't escape those lanes. I I'm sorry, Sean, I read this in a book. So no matter what you say, it's wrong because it's not in that book. And then you have this wonderful conversation, this, you know, and I always have this conversation about vital lung capacity. Yeah. And I use this as an analogy all the time, right? In the, in the academic books, vital lung capacity is finite. You can't grow your vital lung capacity. So as Aerofit, we have this discussion all the time. So in, in the back office of Aerofit, right, we've all been chatting about VLC for quite some time, right? Mm -hmm. And so a while back, I said, let's just change the term. Let's stop calling it vital lung capacity. I'm going to call it accessible vital lung capacity from now on. Because as, as human beings, if we believe we have a cup. I have my cup, my stay a breath ahead cup here. So I'll use plug, plug for Aerofit at the moment, right? Stay a breath ahead. Uh, I, if, if, this, if this is your vital lung capacity and when you fill it up to the top, that's 100%, I understand that a doctor might argue that it's a finite cup. And if I'm in a debate, I could say, okay, I'll, I'll grant you that at the moment. But you're only filling up 70% of your cup. So what do we call the rest of the, the other 30% you're not filling up? And 99.999% of human beings out there, I haven't found the 0 0.001 yet, but I'm looking still, um, ha have been able to fill their lungs to their ultimate vital capacity because they have restrictions, they have bones in the way, they have muscles that won't stretch and so forth. So that lends itself to a human potential conversation. Yes. Because if you take away the excess, if you take away the accessibility to more, if you shut that down because you're a linear mechanic, then I think you're stunting a population, the, the allowance to believe they can go beyond who they are at the moment. And I think that's a shame at the end of the day. And that's, so in the world of TBI, in my world of breathing, that has to be a unifying singularity kind of moment where we all believe that everything is accessible and you can't lock it down. Do you, would you, what do you think about that, Rob? I'm curious. This leads directly into what one of my favorite speakers, C.T. Fletcher, says. I don't know if you know who he is. I, I don't. I don't. He, 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 yeah, he's just, he, he lifts weights like a, like no one's business. And uh, he's this okay. black dude and he's got two crosses tattooed on his chest. And he's like, he's like, about, probably about that wide. And then he says, um, he says, he died on the operating table three times. He shouldn't be there. Hmm. And then, and then he always, I think it's his AARIP card. Is that uh, the, re it, anyway, it's a retirement card, I think. He yes. Says, yeah. I know exactly what you're talking about. It's, yeah. yeah. It's an old said, person he, card. Yeah. He says, <laughs> they gave me this. And then every time I go to the doctor, they tell me, you shouldn't do that. And you shouldn't do this. And you should be that. And you shouldn't do this. And every time I walk out and I go, it's my life and I do what I want. And then he says that um, they always say it, it, it's impossible until some crazy son of a gun comes along and is a bad mofo and they do it anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I think I think I think what what I struggle with um, and especially um, being a very intense person because either you do it or you don't is harnessing that mm -hmm. intensity. But in triathlon um, and in competitive sports, and it, I'm, I'm not really proud of it, but I mean, I, I, my godson's like one year old and I won't let him win. Um, 
you know, at anything because it's just it's not, you know, but I, that in, in competition, I get to release all of this, you know, and and I, I my TBI has then kind of forced me to have that mentality for the past five and a half years, because that's mm. the only way I'm going to reach my full potential. When I reach my full potential, I do not know. I'm, I'm scared as hell to hitting that wall of people going, okay, well, you know, that's how much you can recover from your traumatic brain injury, but I haven't done it yet. Um, not at least right. sports wise. Um, I mean, we cycled up and down hills last year for, for like a few days and, you know, and it's all the gradual stuff, you know, it's like what you say, it has to be done in increments and yeah. So, so I, 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 I believe that, you know, that, that if it wasn't for the Elon Musk's and the Steve Jobs and Nikola Tesla's and I mean, well, how many people weren't persecuted back in back when the church was everything, you know, and they said that the solar system. Oh yeah, system... don't get me started. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, but so, 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 so actually, um, and, and it brings me to a, to an interesting point where it's like, I know these people I've sat in front of them. I've looked at their diplomas on the wall and they all have one thing in common. They're good. They're good. They're fine. They go out, they go, they go home. They're fine. They come out, they come to the office. They're fine. And they don't really want to learn anything more because nope. they're afraid, they're afraid of something and probably afraid of failure, which is just, I like how Kobe Ryan um, explained it. He said that failure doesn't exist. And this is why, because when we train, we do something and then we fail, which means that we couldn't complete it. But then if we can't complete it, we try it again. And if we can't complete it again, we have to analyze why. And then we do it until we learn why. And if we learned why we haven't failed, we've actually learned something. And that means that failure doesn't exist. Right. But there are a few argument. people, there are right. a few people that are willing to go that far. But for me, it was essential to go that far, you know, yourself, because it was life or death. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, it, it's a fascinating thing that doesn't get spoken about enough, I think. And, and, and people kind of shun the conversation. So I, I'm just glad that you have the mindset about it, um, Robson, because it's, it's something you. and, and you're, you know, like you said earlier, you, you, you've had the opportunity to get in front of all these kids and, and, and people, young people who are, are, are willing to hear, you know, still they haven't been closed off yet because they're not adults like us who have our set in our ways. Right. Yeah. So, so um, you know, I, I think looking back and I'm, I'm lucky enough to have kids of my own um, being cognizant about not putting limiting belief structures in any area of someone's life and not meaning and not to do the opposite either to be pie in the sky and say, oh, you know, if you're, if you know, if you're, if you're requires you to be six foot eight inches tall and you're my I'm five foot seven and you're never going to get there son I, I can't will him to be a, a foot taller one day right we're going to work within the realm of things that actually can happen um, but but with with injury and with breath as well people believe their ceilings of recovery and I have yet to see that be true if someone's willing to commit themselves to a believe that that's impossible that but the change is possible and there's so many ancillary aspects, Robson, I think, to recovery yes. of every kind. So if, if I talk about breathing and I talk about just vital lung capacity, that's one measurement. There's hundreds of thousands of ancillary mechanisms that happen because of how you breathe in your body. So it is an ongoing journey where you, you might reach the pinnacle of one data point and, or at least top out on one data point. There are hundreds of thousands of other data points that you might not consciously recognize or we can't even measure yet. So there's an abundant world of capability that we have to explore. So you never truly top out. You and shift, that, you move exactly. around and you discover. Like, I, I, I like what you said. Your, your kid might not be able to become Shaquille O'Neal, but he can become Allen Iverson. You know? I mean, there's still right. two hugely successful basketball players. The other one's like, 
105 foot and the other one's like two foot, but I mean, they're still, <laughs> right, they're right. still great basketball players. <laughs> right, right. But what, what we also don't talk about, which I think is, is a thing that, I mean, it almost took my life, but I mean, mental health and the anxiety around recovery and, and actually the fact that uh, we live in a, I like what Joe Rogan says. He, he says we live in a, most of us live in a world of cushy marshmallows and bullshit. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard the same. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's um, great. He's great. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because we're somehow, at some point, we got so secluded. And, and I mean, right now, you and I, we're in a, we're in a great office. I mean, it's warm. Uh, it's actually, well, it doesn't, it's not raining outside at the moment, but it was raining. I'm not wet. Um, we can close the window. If there's a draft, we call the maintenance guy and go, Hey, look, dude, that window is broken. He comes and fixes it. <laughs> it's a question of, is it now or is it in 72 hours or somewhere in between? So, and that's why I think sports is so, so important because you get all the highs and you get all those lows and, and it's a form of life and death in your mind. And then when you, when you, uh, uh, fail, everyone sees it and it's really good because you need to fail in order to fail, uh, in order to succeed at some point you have to fail. And how do we then, you know, um, uh, uh overcome those things. And I mean, I, I, that's why I'm actually, I'm, I'm here for the Copenhagen Ironman. I'm, I'm announcing it, which is awesome, but I don't have my, uh, uh green ribbon cap on that I usually have on according to my mom right, glued, right. glued glued to my head and I look like a kid in kindergarten but that's a different thing it's for <laughs> it's for mental mental health and traumatic brain injury and i mean right. when you're at the bottom of whatever your bottom is we need help breathing is one thing i would have loved to know it earlier but my neuropsychologist taught me a bit about it but we don't yeah. talk about the fact that it's okay to be really, really low as long as we get help. And we're, 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 we're flock. I mean, we're herd animals, basically. We, we actually, we need, sure. and I say this to the kids all the time. It's not, um, it's not a weakness to ask for, for, for help. It's a strength. But if you don't ask, no one knows that they're supposed to help. And that's when you start feeling alone. Right. And social media, there was actually really good, we're referencing a lot of NBA players right now, but uh, there was a there was a, a survey they did I heard about where uh, NBA players feel more alone than ever in in the social media ages, and I mean these guys have millions of followers on Instagram, but that's not real. Yeah, right. That's just you know, and then I mean it, this device looks really simple, and it and and I mean, but it can actually center if you breathe. And if you take time for yourself, and that's why I really like it so much is because it, it's me time, you know, it's, it's, yes, like it, thank you for saying that. I think, I, I think that's so important for everybody to hear because I, yeah. I get asked about it all the time. Like, well, you're introducing technology to take me into breathing. That's kind of contradicts itself a little bit. And I laugh and I go, put, get the air, <laughs> put it in your mouth and look at that, look at that damn little red ball on your screen. Yeah. And. You know, 10 minutes, five minutes from now, after you've been breathing, you tell me if everything else hasn't vanished, because if you don't get that damn little red ball to follow that line and any, how does anything else exist while you're watching that red ball, right? Every nothing. I could have chaos swirling around me. If I'm tuned in on that red ball, I don't care. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And that's the thing, right? So, so you, you look at that red ball, nothing else matters in that sense. And then after that, you feel centered. And it's me time. And then how often do you actually have, because the, the app, if you get a phone call or whatever, whatever, it doesn't really recover from that, which is good because then you have to do it all again. And that's, <laughs> that's good because you know, it's me time. I, I do have one warning and that's for, if you do this on public transport, if you do it at night beside your girlfriend or partner or whatever you have, not very popular, um, but because, <laughs> yeah, because you sound like Darth Vader and you're no one's father right. in that room. Um, and, but, but the funny thing is that um, I got told uh, a lot, but you should start meditating. That's really good for you. And then I tried 
I downloaded apps and then and then when I I just the voice was so annoying. I mean, like mm -hmm. you know, when someone when you're really angry and someone tells you, "Sir, calm down. We did get you the right plate." Yeah. You know, it's like no. Anyway, and then the mm -hmm. worst thing is like, well, meditate for ten minutes. Go into a room, turn off the lights, and think about nothing. Well, how annoying yeah. is that? Right. I I I got a friend who yeah who told me uh, she's an, uh, an MD in Asian medicine. And she was like, I got, uh, okay, I, I know what you mean. That's really annoying. And she was like, okay, count one is an inhale and two is an exhale. And so, so odd numbers are inhales and, 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 and even numbers are exhales. Get to 99 and then count down back again. And that should be at about 10 minutes. When you lose mm -hmm. track of what you're counting, start over. And I went, well, how hard can that be? And I got right. to 10, five times, you know? <laughs> and, then, and, then, and then I went, okay, I'm a bit busy right now in my head. But then again, the AeroFit takes care of that. You don't need to right. think about it. And there's, not, there's no annoying voice and you're doing something, but you're actively collecting your thoughts, gathering them, archiving them, filing them, and then you feel better. Yeah. So, so you started, Robson, you started using uh, your AeroFit, what, how many months ago was it? It was, I, I forget exactly. Well, I, I first, first got it in it 2019. I first right. got it. Okay. Yeah. And then I used it last year. I used it throughout 19. Then the app wasn't that sophisticated. So I did just different programs. Um, mm -hmm. And, and I wasn't yet at the level where where I was um, actually being able to do more than just um, increase the time I was training, right? Because of gotcha. I started with, yeah. Um, but then, then in 2020, um, uh, we hooked up for another um, uh, a cooperation, which I think was really cool. And just not having, the, you know, not just having the device and doing random stuff. And Jesper wrote me a, 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 a program for our stupid seven project, which was seven Everest things in seven days in seven different countries in Europe, which was really right. interesting. But, yeah. and then, and then I used it to, to, to kind of get uh, the efficiency, uh, cause you don't really break aerobic threshold in that. That's what you just try to go, you know? Um, and then now I used it for, um, uh, you wrote me a program and we spoke in May. Yeah, I believe it was May. And then I used it May, June, and then half of July, and then life happened. Um, and then, then I've, I've been carrying it around with me all the time, but I haven't really uh, used it. And that's why I think it's really cool. I get, I get to be held accountable when I come to the office and people go, <laughs> and I go. Yeah, thanks, Robson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, but, thanks but now, being, thank, thank, you for being, thank you for being honest because that happens to all of us, right? This, yeah. is, this is my full-time job. Not only is this my job, it's my passion on top of it. I, I love breathing practices and I do them every day. There are plenty of times where I get pulled off center. I run out of time. Life changes and life happens. Um, what I would like to hear from you, and because I've heard this from a lot of other athletes and people in general who use AeroFit, they, they feel, they engage with it for a period of time. It, it gets by the wayside. They, it's, it's a habit that gets replaced by something else, but they recognize that they miss it and they recognize that they feel the difference. Like there's something that's lacking or a, a freedom or space that was created that contracts quickly. Well, that's so, the thing. And to me, this... You know this, yeah. That's so the, there, I would like to hear. I would like to thing. hear a little bit about that experience, right? Did that's the damn. That you that's the damn thing. <laughs> right? That I know yeah. that the solution is right here, and it's in my bag, or it's on the table, or whatever, and I just can't get around to doing it. You know, yeah. and and yeah. and I know that it's. I think it's the same thing with all of us. Um, it's the. It's kind of ties into the same psychology as well. Should I look at? that next Netflix series, you know, that episode before I go to bed and then you go, fine. Yeah, why not? And then you're like, <laughs> ah, damn it, it's 1 a.m. again, you know? Um, and, then, and then quickly also, what I, so um, what my coaches and, and what I like about AeroFit too is that everything is, um, it, it's, it's um, damn, what's the word in English? 
uh, helhet in Swedish. Coconut, uh, in Finnish it's coconut sauce. You, you know what I'm talking about, Sean, don't you? No, <laughs> it's, 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 yes, not yet. <laughs> exactly. Um, it's, it's, um, it's a, uh, it's an entirety. It's not the right word, but it's like a, it, it's, it's, um, it's a 360 thing. It's not just like certain okay. parts. It's not just the, um, you know what? I'm going to walk like out from here. All, like, all, like all encompassing. There we go. Kind of there we thing. go. Right. Good. Okay. You saved cool, me, cool. Gotcha, you saved gotcha. me from, yeah. Uh, Cause you saved I'm me from you. walking out from here and then in the Metro going, Oh yeah, that was it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's an all encompassing thing. So it's not just the fact that you need the physical training because f- physical training for me um, needs stretching and that needs massage and that needs breath work and that needs rest and that needs recovery. And then it's good if I lie in my recovery pump, my active uh, uh, compression boots, you know, and it's a whole mm-hmm. thing. And then, you add and subtract all the time things that you know you need here and there and you might not sometimes you might not need the breathing exercises sometimes you might not need the stretching but if when you look at the entire year everything should be present at least 85 percent and that's what i try to i try to actually do 90 percent right and 10 percent then you know is life sure you know no, so, it's, so, it's interesting. So the, the, the list, the list of things you just started to stretch and that list could have gone on forever about the things that you do to train. Um, I, I want to say this to everybody who's listening from an AeroFit perspective for a moment, right? A Rob's uh, the product, the program, the protocol that I wrote for you and that I write for almost every other type of athlete. There's usually one limiting factor to it. I usually don't ask of people to do more than 12 or 14 minutes a day at max, right? So it, it, it's, it's not a, it, the time to value is really strong. The ratio of yes. time to value with AeroFit because it because of what you get out of it. But I almost think that the residual effect of spending time with AeroFit is as important as what you get while you're using AeroFit because all those other areas, the recovery time, the sleep time, everything else, is directly affected by how you consciously breathe the other 95% of your day when you're not using AeroFit. So it is this kind of incredible, one, one thing that you always have, no matter what stage of thing you're doing is you're always breathing. Um, it's 30,000 breaths a day, right? You know, so it's that with much? you. Do you, yeah, it's a, it's a lot, right? So do you harness that or do you neglect it? So, you know, in the world of yoga, and I, I won't get all yoga philosophy here on anybody, but right. Um, the, the true yogi will recall every single breath he or she took their entire life. That's how important breath is in the philosophy of yoga, meaning how much do you actually pay attention to the present moment and what that breath is bringing into you and how are you experiencing life in that moment? If your connection is that strong to your breath, everything else kind of takes care of itself, right? That's a yoga concept, if you will. And so for me, coming back to your breath as often as you can, knowing that you're not going to come back all the time, but having a little, you know, guilty conscious person sitting on your shoulder saying, don't stop thinking about your breath. Don't stop thinking about your breath. It's important. Slow your breathing down. Come back to the basics all the time. If you start to get that built into your psyche a little bit more, and you'll start to realize that, wait, I actually have the time to pay attention to my breathing a lot more than I thought because it doesn't take a lot of energy to do that. So we're, we're trying, AeroFit to me is a great tool to raise awareness of the other 23 hours a day kind of thing. Does two that make th- sense? Two things like, and, and, and one thing yeah. it's actually, I did my first yoga class. I can't remember when it was, but it was back in 2000 and it was prior to 2010, but I can still remember when I when I, for the first time took the, the, what do you, you call it? The, hang on. What's the breath mechanism called? You, there's a Ucha. No, hang on. Uh, Ujjayi. Ujjayi. Yeah. Yeah. I remember, I remember when yeah. I, I remember, I remember the feeling I had when I first hacked that, you know, that breathing. Yeah. Which is really interesting. Now that you say it, I remember exactly where I was and, and, and yeah, I remember it, which I think is very, um, telling. That, that that's it, actually it. And yeah, for everyone that thinks you have to sit for an hour with this thing, and that's that, that's not true. It's like it's like you said, you 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 did a program where it's 
four plus two minutes in the morning and four plus four minutes in the evening. And, and one thing that I, I, I got after I started with AeroFit was when Tony Robbins said that if you, don't, if you can't take 10 minutes out of your life to do something for yourself, you don't have time at all and you're not in control. Right. And that's what I feel. That's, that's, that's the anxiety that, 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 that built in here where it's like, oh, God, I should, I should, I should, I should. And then you're so grateful afterwards that you've done it and you get a physical benefit in your training. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you can't, you can't always find four hours to get on a bike, but you know, you pretty much can find 10 minutes. But think about it. Somehow, it <laughs> somehow I managed to carve out 10 to 30 hours of training in a week and I can't sit down with this thing for four minutes. <laughs> Where are my priorities? Huh? Yeah. I'll Where are my priorities? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I need to set myself. That's I'm gonna quite go an home. Endorsement. That's quite an endorsement, Robson. Thanks. <laughs> no, but I like. I need to. I'm gonna. So I live at the, the the race venue hotel, Comfort Hotel, Copenhagen Airport. It's in the wrong. I said in the wrong order, but it's a cool hotel. And I'm gonna sit down because I live on the eleventh floor. And I'm gonna sit down with this thing today. I promise you, Siana, who's here yes, too. Or- who's, yeah, I promise you. I'm gonna and you hold me accountable to it. I'm gonna sit down with this thing. Right. I'm gonna look out over Copenhagen and probably close my eyes, and then I'm gonna breathe. We'll have we'll have Sienna hunt you down if you don't. Uh, so uh, uh, yeah, want, you know where I live now. Evi- we yeah. want evidence. We want, evi- we want evidence, Rob. Oh yeah, yeah. It's in the form of a story. It's an Instagram story. That's the only way I can be held accountable. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Fair enough. Fair. We'll take and the thing is, the, th- no, the totally thing cool. is like the thing is like which which is like after that. You glide into it, and then you're in your new routine again, and then the the monkey's off your back, and it's all good, you know. Of course, of course, and we're all every, all human beings do that. It, it, exactly. It's, it's 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 hard for the best of us to consistently do the same thing in and out because people seek variety as well, right? There's always there's always a, a you know you're looking for the next shiny object, you're looking for the next thing that might change your life a little bit. So there's a lot there's a lot of space we're competing for to consistently do the same thing all the time. So. Um, you know, the fact that you're coming back to it, more important to me is I like the idea that you recognize that you missed it or something was missing when you stopped doing it yeah. because that's a sign that it was creating something inside of you, yeah. right? It was allowing you to feel something different. And so hopefully we could find ways to make that call a little bit stronger. Like as a, even as a company, AeroFit, right? How do we, how do we draw people back in or keep reminding them? And, and honestly, you and I talking today, Robson, Part of part of our equation of trying to solve this problem of motivating people to keep coming back is for me to be fortunate enough to have conversations with people like you and share the story. You know, so I think you know you just being here and and telling your story and sharing and spreading knowledge, right? Helps. It might help one person Hopefully. put this back in their mouth or think, and that's enough. Or think about life in a different way, and that's enough, right? Then we've done our job. We've gotten the message out there. So. Um, this is a really amazing opportunity for our audience, for me, uh, especially to speak with you. Um, thank you. Thank you for having me. Your story is brilliant. Your, your, you, no, your resilience is phenomenal. I sure as hell love your attitude about everything. We get along great. Uh, we do. And, and we share some commonality. To, we share some commonality as well, which is really cool. Yeah. Um, so why don't you, you know, I, I want to, I, I guess we should probably start wrapping up. Uh, this is my yeah. problem. I could talk to people like you for eight hours straight. So I got to look, I got to look at the clock. Um, I have no consensus so of time you're, you're, because of my brain injury. So, so <laughs> <laughs> we're a bad match then. You and I. Um, yeah. <laughs> Sienna will tell you I could talk for hours on end without stopping. But so you're you're in town for you're in town for a race right now. Is that correct? In Copenhagen. Yes. Um, I yes, and I have to pinch myself every time I get to say this. I'm an announcer for Ironman. I am one of the few people that this organization gives a microphone to and says, do your thing, do your thing. Yeah, it's right on. And, and, and you see, it's not about me. It's the thing is that I think there are 2,500 athletes that are going to race on Sunday. And there's an organization behind that. That is like a thousand people where I think there are 600, 700 volunteers or something like that. And they can all do their job perfectly. But if I don't manage to pinpoint a successful atmosphere with my voice and my presence and my energy, 
everyone will think it's a crap event. <laughs> no pressure. Exactly. But <laughs> the thing is, and Code Ryan said it really well. He said that our, our um, mission in life is to find our box and dance beautifully in it. Mm. I don't know if that finish line or that microphone is my box, but I sure as fucking hell love it. So yeah, yeah. And then that's obvious. I mean, don't tell Iron Man, but I'd be there for free because I love triathlon. So yeah, <laughs> I will. We'll edit that yeah. out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and like and then and so I'm in town for that. And and Copenhagen is such a cool city. I mean, if you haven't been, yeah. it's it's one of the few true capital city events. Um, and it goes through the whole town or the whole city. And, uh, it's a fast course, by the way. And, uh, mm. yeah. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's, and I, I, I stumbled into this. I, I mean, I, I couldn't race in 2018. And I told a friend that was organizing the 2018, uh, 70.3 in Lahti, an hour away from my hometown. And they gave me a chance and so there, there you are. are. Life happened. Yeah. yeah. Life happened. That's so cool. Uh, so, so, so what, what, what comes next, Rob? What, what's beyond this week for you? Like, what, what are you looking at for the next, you know, six months or a year? Like, do you have any cool plans or anything coming up? Yes. I rate, I, I, I go, um, so yeah, actually I do. Um, yeah. And this is probably the coolest thing ever. Um, which is I'm checking my phone now. Um, because our due date um, was on Friday. Um, and my girlfriend hasn't messaged me yet that she's, Oh boy. Uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> a little girl. Um, so that's, 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 wow. that's what's happening. Congratulations. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> but, Some, uh, somewhat significant. Yeah. Somewhat significant. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I race, um, no, hang on. I announce Copenhagen on Sunday. Then I go to a local event in Finland next week. Um, and then I might announce an event in Sweden in a, f uh, in a month. Um, and then okay. I'm going to race my Ironman in, in, uh, probably Portugal on the 23rd of October. And my, nice. Nice look. my goal is to beat my old time. I've done one prior to my brain injury. That was all I had time with, which is 10 hours, 14 minutes. And it's still right vexes me to this day because i i went 50 minutes over budget it was supposed to be a sub 10 um yep but but um and then i want to punch my ticket to hawaii and then i want to win my age group in hawaii that is fantastic i'm i my fingers crossed i'm not sure i'm i would i'm hoping somehow i can get to hawaii for the event so maybe if maybe if that's possible maybe well, that would be that would be 2022 so anyway cool. that would be 2020 right. anytime right anyway and my goal yeah. is to someday be, uh be allowed to announce hawaii which was would be, really that would be cool. amazing so and yeah, yeah. and and then we need to meet uh, live someday anyway so i need to oh yeah. no doubt no no doubt i uh, so just to, just to throw it out there i i mean i know i you never know where anybody's going to be and you you have a kid on the way so hey for, first of all Congratulations, having a child is a thank you thing. So it's it's one it's it's not a prison, it's a playground, right? So so think of it as as one of the coolest things you could do. Um, I love my kids; I, they're the best thing that ever happened to me. Um, um, I'm headed over to Belgium in the third week of September for the UCI World Road Championship, Cycling Road Championship. So Aerofit, we're gonna have a we're gonna have a dome in in uh, Leuven, in Belgium. So I'll be there the week of the 20th. I'll be there the 22nd to the 26th in Leuven um, with archers who you met in the office and a yes. few other people. So we'll be down there. But then we need to, then we need to see because maybe I could go see a sponsor of mine, bio racer. Cause I think, I think, okay, actually I'm, I'm doing this the wrong way. Now I need to ask my girlfriend if it's okay that I travel. <laughs> yes, yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Stina, if you're listening secretly through the phone, I'm going to ask you first. Um, you just, yeah, you just but, some good points there, friend. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, uh, but at, because, 
Yeah, that could be, that could be, yeah, 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 we could definitely do that. Yeah, absolutely. I'll try to make please, that work. Please come down. We're, not, if you can, um, first of all, we're going to have a lot of other cool friends coming to see us there too. Yeah. Lots of people you would probably like and get along with because they're a bunch absolutely. of, uh, it's a real, it's a real cast of Motley people, right? We're all like, we're all crazy people who love sports and stuff like that. So I think we're going to have Oh, a I'm perfectly sane you according to myself. That would be awesome. I'm perfectly yes, sane yes, right? according to my say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, let, let's see if let's see if let's see if that works out for sure. Um, I, 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 I don't want to be remiss um, because we're doing this. We're recording this for YouTube. Right. So I want to make sure that in, in the comments below, I am sure we will have your social media uh, information. And, you know, if there's anything else that you want to share down there, you know, once this is produced, Robson, let's make sure the audience knows what you're up to how to follow you, how to keep yeah. track of your life and stuff like that Please. so everybody can stay engaged. And um, if, and if, if let, you let, want, let, if you want to send me a message, Instagram is probably the best. Uh, send me a DM, ask me about the arrow fit, you know, uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. Instagram, if you send me an email, that's probably the worst way to get a hold of me. Um, same. I, yeah, same. yeah. So, so just DM me. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah, that's very cool. And so what, so for everybody who doesn't know, so what, what is your Instagram handle? And of course we'll write it down. We'll write it below, but what is your Instagram handle? Robson? Rob. Yeah. Rob, oh my gosh. Rob's, I'm calling you on the spot. Robson dot Lindbergh. <laughs> that's it. Rob, I knew Robson it. Robson dot Lindbergh, everybody. Right. Yeah. Okay. We'll make sure we write it. <laughs> Sorry for the quiz. Um, no, don't worry. Don't hold worry. You accountable. I mean, I forgot my <laughs> Alzheimer's medicine at home, so it's all good. You know, <laughs> Right. This is the best day to forget something, right? <laughs> well, listen, I, I mean, let, I, I think we should probably wrap it up just for yes. time constraints here because I, 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 have, I have calls I have to get to and I know you have other things to do. But I would like to, you know, from the bottom of my heart and for everybody in Aerofit, thank you uh, for taking the time, Robson, to come chat. Thank you for it's a pleasure, me. dude. It's great. You, the, I now get to smile the rest of my day because I shared some energy with you, which is really awesome. The same. So uh, much thank appreciated. You. Much appreciated. Yeah, thank you. And thank you, by the way, to the person, the person I think to your left, Sienna, who is putting Sienna. all this together yes. behind us, right? So thank you, Sienna, yeah. our, our friend behind the scenes there who makes all this magic happen. So good job, uh, right? Um, but and, any any last thing to say, Robson, other than goodbye? Just, I'll give you your, I'll give you the last word here if if you want. Thank you for having me on. Um, it's um, many people ask why I work with brands and I work with brands I get along with. It's not for the financial incentive. It's not for, uh, it's, it's, it's mixed of, it's a mix of, of data and it's a mixed mix of feeling. That's, that's very important to me. And then let's, let's, um, let's maybe end the way I usually start my talks, which is if you can see the invisible, you can do the impossible. And if you think seeing the invisible is hard, you're doing it right now. I've got traumatic brain injury and I shouldn't be here, yeah. but I still am. So thank you. Right on. 